Welcome, everyone. My name is Will Smith. I'm the Director of Internationalization at the Maury House School of Education and Sport, where I also lead our master's program in comparative education and international development. I'm thrilled today to chair our national launch of the 2023 Global Education Monitoring Report on Education and Technology. I want to give special thanks to our guest from Education Scotland and UNESCO's GEM Report for being here to share what is quite a monumental report. I also want to thank our co-organizers from the University of Glasgow and UN House Scotland for helping to put this report on, or launch on. Today's event is going to be recorded, and we'll make sure we share a link with registered participants, and it will also be made public on UNESCO's GEM Report website later on. If you're going to share today's event on social media, please use the hashtag um, pound Scotland GEMR launch with your sharing. Today, we'll have a brief welcome from our deputy head of school, uh, followed by the presentation of the 2023 GEM report, a response from the Scottish government, and then an extended panel discussion where we'll be talking about digital devices, artificial intelligence, the role of government, and teachers and technology before we give some brief closing remarks. So at this point, I want to invite Dr. Sam, Samantha Faulkner up to give a welcome from the school. Sam Faulkner is the deputy head of school at Maury House School of Education and Sport. With over 20 years of experience working in higher education, she has responsibility for the student experience at Maury House, while her research focuses on physical activity and health of young people. Some of her recent work is focused on uh, health data literacy and the role that personal technology might play in shaping health behaviors of children and young people. Uh, welcome, Sam. Thank you very much, Will. I'm very, very glad to be here and welcome colleagues and guests. I'd um, like to extend you a very, very warm and enthusiastic welcome to the Scottish launch of the 2023 Global Education Monitoring Report on Technology and Education and to Murray House School of Education and Sport on what is a gloriously sunny autumnal day. This event marks an important moment in the quest to understand and navigate the profound transformations taking place in education driven by digital technology. As we gather here today, we confront a pivotal question, a tool on whose terms? This query resonates with us at Murray House School of Education and Sport, one of the highest ranked schools of education in the world and where technology, education and research excellence intersect. The 2023 Global Education Monitoring Report acknowledges the impact of technology on education and it challenges us to critically assess how we harness its power to enhance learning experiences for all. It brings to light a critical perspective that regulations for technology, when set outside of the education sector, may not necessarily address the genuine needs of education. This report goes further. It calls upon us to make decisions about technology and education that prioritise the needs of our learners. We are asked to consider the appropriateness, equity, evidence and sustainability of technology applications in education. In essence, this report provides us with a compass, a guiding light for policymakers and educators as we navigate the intricate intersection of technology and education. It challenges us to pause and reflect on the implications of our choices to ensure that technology serves as an enabler rather than an obstacle in our pursuit of high quality education. So today's event has three objectives. First, we're here to present the findings of the 2023 Global Education Monitoring Report on Technology and Education. The report distills research, experience and expertise into a comprehensive examination of the current state of technology and education worldwide. It is a vital resource for anyone committed to shaping the future of education. Second, we will highlight examples of good practices from around the world in the use of technology and education. We believe that by sharing these best practices, we can inspire innovation and encourage collaboration and foster a global community of educators and policy makers dedicated to harnessing technology for the betterment of education. 
Thirdly, we will showcase the experiences of Scotland and engage in a discussion on how the global recommendations from the report resonate with our national realities. By examining our unique context, we can ensure that the lessons learnt from this report are applicable and relevant to our educational landscape. We are indeed privileged to have esteemed speakers with us here today, representing both international and national perspectives on this critical issue. Anna Daddio, a representative from UNESCO's Global Education Monitoring Report, will provide global insights. Additionally, Ollie Bray, Strategy Director at Education Scotland, will offer us a closer look at Scotland's approach to technology and education. Following these insightful presentations, we will enjoy a panel discussion that will bring together diverse perspectives to delve deeper into the complexities and opportunities surrounding technology and education. This is where the magic happens, where ideas are shared and solutions emerge. So, in closing, I just want to express my deep gratitude to all of you who have contributed to the creation of the report and all of you that have come to join with us today. This work is instrumental in shaping the future of education and we're indebted to the dedication and expertise of the contributors. Let's make the most of this gathering with open, insightful and forward-thinking discussion. Let's use this as a springboard toward a future where technology serves as a powerful tool for enhancing education and where learners' needs are at the forefront of our decision-making processes. Thank you so much for your presence today. I look forward to the enriching discussions and the insights that will unfold during the event. Many thanks. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Sam, for the warm welcome to Mori House. I'm going to now invite up our speaker from UNESCO's GEM report, Dr. Anna Cristina Dadio. Anna Cristina Diado, Dadio, sorry, <laughs> is senior policy analyst in the Global Education Monitoring Report team at UNESCO, where she leads the thematic work, the peer project, and is a gender focal point. Prior to this position, Anna worked at the OECD for more than 10 years on a comprehensive list of issues with a particular emphasis on the role of policies. Before that, Anna was a research professional, professor in microeconomics econometrics applied to labor market education issues. She carried out research in several universities and research centers, including the Center for Applied Econometrics, University of Copenhagen, the Higher Institute of, for Labor Studies, Catholic University of Leuven, the Department of Economics, University of Aris, the Center of Operations, Research and Econometrics, and IRIS of the Catholic University of Leuven La Neuve. She is an economist by background with one PhD in quantitative economics from CORE and IRIS at the Catholic University of Leuven La Neuve, and a PhD in public economics from the University of Pavia in Italy. So, Anna, thank you so much for joining us today. Let me thank jump. you, Will. Um, so, so, that's uh, the thing I should use? Yes, yes you do. Okay, so first of all, Thank you to be here. Uh, I'm very honored to be here for the launch of uh, the Global Education Monitoring Report 2023 on technology in education. And I would like to thank, first of all, the University of Edinburgh for hosting this launch, but also the uh, Scottish government, the UNA House, and the uh, School of Education, University of uh, Glasgow uh, for their contribution. Um, this report uh, and they should be set from the beginning and what I will be presenting is just a half of the real and the effective report. So as you know, the Global Education Monitoring Report has a thematic part and the monitoring part. So I really urge you to read also the monitoring part because today I'm just presenting the thematic part of uh, the report. So. Um, what is important uh, to say from the beginning is that um, when we started working on this report, uh, and it's uh, really surprising to know that the theme of the technology of this report was decided even before COVID with our advisory board. But uh, we can realize how much it is timely even three years or four years later, and it will be 
increasingly um, relevant uh, in the year to come. So when we started working on this report, rather to asking the question, um, what can, how to apply technology in education? That is generally what is done, technology in education, uh, we look at the inputs and then we try to apply them without knowing why we are doing that. So this report has started from a different point and I think this is really something that makes it original and uh, relevant in this context. The question we, has asked, we have asked is what are the educational issues we are trying to solve, first of all. And uh, you will see in the report that in the first part there are uh, chapters uh, talking about issues of equity uh, when looking at the access for disadvantaged groups, access to contents, the quality uh, issues, the efficiency issues. So what are the educational issues we are trying to solve? And then the second question, if these are the, the issues we are trying to solve, how and uh, if technology can help? And if technology can help, what are the minimum condition under which this can happen? So the second part of the report, of the thematic part of the report, um, really focus on uh, issues like access to technology, hmm? uh, the situation concerning equitable access to technology worldwide, or teachers, or governance and regulation that are central and critical in the discussion of technology in education. So, and um, what is important to say at this point, uh, that what we have seen with this report is that uh, uh, it's true that technology is changing education, but uh, it is not yet transforming education. And uh, if you look at the scope and the scale of technological change, these have been huge. Mm. Uh, just uh, looking at the number of internet users uh, between 20, uh, 2002 and to, uh, 2022, it has moved from 16% to 65%. So this is a huge amount. Even the uh, number of people that participate in massive online um, open courses, it has increased. It has reached 220 uh, million without considering China. This is, these are huge amount. However, when we look at um, the number of people that is exposed uh, to technology in education, we realize that this is not homogeneous. Uh, access to technology and the use of technology varies according to income, according to education level, according to gender and geographical location. For example, this figure shows that only one in ten uh, students in um, upper middle and high income countries are regularly exposed to at least one hour of digital device use in math and science classes. Mm. And um, less than one in two lower secondary students are connected, in fact, when we look at uh, uh, the issue in, within schools. So this means that SDG4 is really a complex goal and this is why it is very important to ask the question we have asked um, in analyzing the issue of technology in education. It is not just looking at uh, um, a, an input and so say, oh, we have this application and we would like to use. What is the impact? What is the evidence is saying about the use of this application or this digital device in education? And uh, this is the second point that is very important, the point that good impartial evidence in this area is still very rare. First of all, because there is a very rapid turnover of technology. Mm? And so we know that uh, education technology evolves really fast. Um, products change on average every three years. 
and we realize that the research or evaluation of technology cannot keep the pace with that. So that's one first point. The second is even if when and where there are some evidence, this is very rare. Mm? So for instance, in the United Kingdom, 7% of companies did randomized trials to look at the impact of technolo education technology products. And there are 18% of academic studies that focus on the impact. And what is also very important to say is that uh, often are those that produce this application that evaluate it with the risk that this imply. Now, um, if we look at the di this different question about that I mentioned, uh, what are the educational issues we are trying to solve with education and is technology able to solve these, these uh, issues? The first issue is that it is true that technology offers a lifeline for many, many people, but at the same time, it excludes many more. Mm? And um, we have example from Latin America that has championed, for instance, the use of radio and television. So what this means is that technology doesn't need to be really extremely uh, perfect or really innovative. The importance is that what is happening when it is used. And uh, there are examples, for example, in Brazil and Mexico with the use of a telesecundaria uh, program that um, uh, there have been a huge increase in uh, the learning outcomes of people that have uh, looked, watched these uh, TV programs. And, uh, at the same time, the most uh, important impact of technology has been with lear for learners with disabilities and with the use, for instance, of assistive technology. But as you will see in the report, there are also issues there for the procurement. So how to make sure that these accessibility um, features are really, uh, really uh, I would say highlighted in the procurement of these uh, uh, products, uh, for example, by schools, by Department of Education. And uh, also in emergencies, uh, uh, technology has helped uh, a lot. Refugees, for instance. All these issues are dealt in, uh, in the chapter on access uh, for disadvantaged learners. However, what we have noticed in looking at the access to uh, technology for refugees is that only 10% of these interventions have been implemented by the government, which has, of course, important um, drawbacks in terms of the sustainability. And um, also, very often, the point is that the right to education is becoming kind of uh, um, a synonym of the right to connection when this is not the case for millions of learners. And uh, we have seen what has happened during the COVID pandemic when uh, one third of all learners worldwide, worldwide has been excluded from distance learning and 72% of the poorest couldn't have access to distance learning opportunities. In terms of quality, uh, also here, it is true that some uh, technology uh, can improve some types of learning in some context. And it increasingly greatly access to resources and can fill gaps, allowing, for example, personalization, adaptation of contents, and uh, as we see, also um, engagement of students with a new method of uh, teaching and learning, like, for instance, augmented uh, virtual reality um, devices. However, and I will come back on this later, um, it can be also detrimental if it is excessive, and why? Because uh, there are many studies that have focused on the impact on well-being, on privacy, on safety of uh, devices. And again, as I said already, it should focus on learning 
and uh, what is really wanted with this application on learning outcomes, not on digital outputs. And we know, for example, that uh, the one-to-one -one technology models that have been largely used uh, in the world uh, has been decreasing. So when I mean one-to-one -one technology, I am, I, am speaking I am speaking about uh, distributing laptops, distributing tablets to each student, to each uh, um, teacher, without before focusing on the learning and uh, the preparedness of teachers, for example, on, this, uh, uh, on the use of these devices. And again, uh, in terms of quality, it not, technology need not to be advanced to be effective. For example, in China, um, recorded lessons from very good teachers that have been broadcasted to 100 million of rural students uh, have been shown with an evaluation made 10 years after this uh, uh, intervention. They have improved outcomes, learning outcomes by 32% of the rural students and they have also uh, been successful in bridging the gap uh, the earnings up between rural and uh, urban students. In terms of efficiency, technology also presents uh, a lot of opportunities. Um, so distance uh, uh, teacher education is efficient in, the ter in, ter in, in respect of cost effectiveness, but it is not so effective as having someone in person teaching uh, the subjects. And computer-based and computer adaptive tests open opportunity in assessments, but transparent uh, uh, data on cost that this computer-based um, and computer adaptive tests um, imply are not uh, available. And uh, also it is true that the learning data analytics improve, can improve feedback. But uh, data literacy is limited and the, how much people can use uh, this analytics and uh, the method to, b to build these analytics is also not uh, uh, very um, common. Something that is very important, I think it's critical in the discussion we are having today, is the regulation. So, Online content is grown often without an accompanying, effective and appropriate regulation. So we know very well, for instance, with uh, the open educational resources that technology help content creation and adaptation um, and can drastically re uh, reduce costs, as I just said in the previous slide. But, uh, Online content is mainly produced in English. 92% of the open education resources available worldwide are in English, which, of course, has implication on the relevance and the significativity of the education that is delivered. And very often, it is really the, the the higher education that has benefited from these online education resource accesses and uh, but with very often with platforms that need uh, norms and the regulation f to regulate their quality and their access and very often uh, the technology is uh, bought uh, to plug a gap uh, but there is absolutely no view on the long-term cost of technology in education. First of all, because the full cost of technology in education is really underestimated. Just to give you an example, the face value of education uh, represents 25% of the full cost of whatever intervention um, of education technology. 75% amounts to many other hidden costs or other costs including maintenance, reparation, uh, training of people that have, for example, if you think about uh, uh, application that uh, need to be protected about, about uh, uh, against vulnerabilities or cyber attacks and you think about the cost of uh, training people that can protect the application 
of vulnerabilities, you may realize that what you see as the cost of an application of a device is just, uh, I would say, just the peak of the iceberg. Um, and uh, very often money is not well spent. Uh, there is this example that I found is very, um, is very important. Two thirds of educational licenses in the United States went unused. So, because people buy and uh, then uh, they don't know how to use, uh, they are not part of a very, um, a kind of coordinated action, uh, which implies also discussion about governance. And also, the costs are additional. So, the JAM report has done some estimation of the cost uh, that will, need, will be needed for very basic scenario. And it has uh, really uh, uh, computed that uh, uh, this investment uh, to get a very basic uh, uh, digital um, scenario will increase the financing gap these countries have to achieve SDG targets by 50%. So where are the priorities? This is the question also. And as you know, um, um, with the theme of the report, the theme of the report, uh, every year we also produce country profiles. So, and uh, we have uh, drafted 211 country profiles on technology and education, and then we have mapped the information from policies and legislations uh, from the different countries. And these, what you see in this radar is some of the information, there is much more either on the website, on the report, about what policy and legislation communicate to us. For example, only 60% of countries worldwide have legislation on data privacy that focus on education. Okay. Uh, and only 19% regulate the use of personal devices in schools. And then there are many other important issues coming out, so the extent to which countries are protecting, uh, are, um, uh, sorry, uh, are pursuing universal access for electricity, for uh, access to internet, etc. You can go on the website, it's education-profiles.org. Um, uh, um, and so, to come to the recommendation, and so I am almost done, the, uh, the report has uh, considered four trade-offs to really um, be able and to give uh, to policy maker, to decision maker, recommendation about the use of technology in education. Because there are four trade-offs. The first trade-off are the first one about uh, what technology and education offers in terms of opportunities of personalization and adaptation and the social dimension of education that requires instead students coming to, together in a class to learn. The second trade-off is uh, between Inclusivity, so the fact that uh, technology can help or offer a lifeline to many people and especially disadvantaged learners and the exclusivity, the fact that technology education at the end can exclude many more uh, compared to what it includes really. And then the third is about, is, um, about uh, uh, the language that is used uh, on technology in education that is often a language of business uh, and is not uh, a language talking about the common good of education. And finally, the, um, is the trade-off between the short-term gain or efficiency versus the long-term cost. And uh, considering this, uh, long, this, um, these uh, four trade-offs, uh, the report, the GEM report, uh, we have uh, proposed a compass to policymakers to decide whether the use of education technology is uh, to be pursued. And this is about, is the use of education, education technology is uh, appropriate? Is it equitable? Is it scalable? And is it sustainable? And for each of these points, 
we have developed uh, clear key messages. So for instance, uh, is it appropriate? What does it mean? Is it appropriate for the context? Uh, um, this means that, for example, uh, it is important to reform curricula for uh, digital, for, uh, digital tools that improve learning, but they are not attached to specific technology. They are broad reform that allows really uh, to take, uh, um, uh, to take uh, this uh, uh, appropriateness in, uh, in consideration. It is important for education technology to be appropriate that the government uh, design, monitor and evaluate policies with the participation of teachers and learners. In the United States a survey uh, found that only, they are only um, included in 41% of cases. And again, ensure solutions are fit uh, for the context. Technology equitable, I already talked about that. Uh, why and when it is, it is not, the use of technology is equitable when it is not an advantage for the most affluent uh, students and it leaves all the other behind. Uh, the technology should be, the use of technology should be focused on uh, supporting the marginalized. And this is also means uh, for government to set national targets on meaningful uh, school internet connectivity by 2030. As you know, the GEM report and the UIS, the Institute of Statistics of UNESCO, have started this work on the uh, benchmark, the first uh, SDG4 scorecard benchmark indicating how much countries are distant or close to the, um, uh, to the benchmark they need to reach uh, in 2025 and 2030 uh, was published this year in January. And the, uh, another target, another benchmark on connectivity has been added to those already existing uh, after the Transformation Education su um, Summit. And uh, so uh, whether the use of technology is scalable requires the creation of bodies that uh, can evaluate in a partial way education technology. This doesn't happen or happens too rarely. Uh, it is needed that uh, uh, not only the face value of education, education technology is evaluated, but the full cost of ownership and implementation and also it's important to ensure transparency on public spending and terms. And finally, it is sustainable. This means to look also at the impact in the long term. It's about protecting learners and teachers, human rights, well-being, safety and privacy. It is about considering the material and energy implication of the use and application of education technology. You know that there is the, this um, uh, federation uh, of uh, environment that has estimated that taking away, uh, sorry, um, uh, extending the lifespan of uh, devices uh, for one year would be equivalent to uh, reduce CO2, CO2 emission equivalent to one million of cars off the road. Hmm? And very, very rarely we think about the implication of energy. So take on our terms, our campaign, uh, the report says keep learners and uh, best interest uh, at the center of a framework that is based on human rights. So adopt a humanistic vision for the use and application of technology in education. Focus on learning outcomes and not on digital inputs. And most importantly, digital technology and technology in education should not be a substitute for, but a complement of human interaction. It should not substitute the relation and interac interaction that is between a teacher and the student. It should be used a as a complement. And this is really the message we want to share with our campaign, Tech on Our Terms. Thanks a lot. So hopefully we're able to jump into some of these uh, deeper, more critical issues during our panel discussion. So at this point, I want to invite our panelists up uh, to join us at the table. 
Um, so you should have a name next to you. So everybody, if you'd come on up, and we will transition over to our panel discussion. And Anna has it. All right. Uh, as we get ready for our panel discussion, I want to uh, welcome our panel moderator, Dr. Gary Don. So Gary is the founder and executive director of UN House Scotland, one of our co-organizers today. A civil society organization committed to the mission, vision, values, and goals of the UN at the grassroots level. Previously, Gary held the post of advisor on higher education at the Commonwealth Secretariat and was a tenured academic at the University of Edinburgh. Also joining us on the panel today, we haven't heard from yet, is Dr. Victor McNair. Victor is an independent education consultant and works with the Digital Schools Award, which we just heard about, mentioned, as part of the development team. He is jointly responsible for developing UK and European work of the DSA program. Victor has taught PGCE in technology and design, uh, master's in ed and PhD courses at the universities Jordanstown and Cloraine campuses, and also had the responsibility for supporting professional uh, development of teachers and learners. Our final two panelists joining today are Dr. Ben Williamson. Uh, ben Williamson is a senior lecturer at the Center for Research and Digital Education at the University of Edinburgh here at Morey House School of Education and Sport and an editor of the Journal of Learning, Media and Technology. He is currently leading a project examining the intersections of biology and, de and data science with education funded by the Le Leverhulme Trust and is a member of the ESRC funded Center for Social Socio-Digital Futures. And our final panelist today is Dr. Simon McGrath. Simon McGrath holds the established chair in education at the University of Glasgow, where he researches the relationship between education and economic, human, and social development. He is author of Rutledge's textbook on education and international development, and lead editor of the same publisher's handbook on the same topic. He is a former UNESCO chair, editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Educational Development, and chair of the UCFED executive. His extensive policy experience includes leading work for UNESCO, the Commonwealth, and SADC, and is advisor of the Right to Education Initiative. So now that everybody's set, I'm going to hand my mic over to Gary. So thank you so much, Gary. Uh, thank you very much, Will. And thank you very much, both of you so far, for the wonderful um, presentations. And uh, just so much to take in, isn't there? It's incredibly um, complex. And both of you gave us a very good overview of the issues that we're going to try and take up in these four areas just now of digital devices, artificial intelligence, the role of government, and teachers. And we've got a very short space of time, and I've been told to keep my words short, so I shall do that. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask each person specific questions, and just to let you know, they have had those questions before, yeah? So it's not um, that they are totally wonderful in being able to respond so quickly to <laughs> complex questions. On the other hand, they are wonderful because they're here and they're going to answer the questions. Um, so Anna, thank you for your presentation. The GEMS report recommendation to ban mobile phones in classrooms has been one of the most surprising and controversial recommendations. Can you please share more on the evidence and thinking behind the recommendation? And just before you answer, I will just add that these questions came in part from the ones that you have submitted when you um, filled in your uh, form to take part today. So we've tried to incorporate your questions into this. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Gary. And, uh Thanks again for giving me this opportunity. So that's a very important question and interesting question. So as, as I was saying uh, during the presentation, one of the work uh, we have been doing in parallel to the report has been to prepare these country profiles. And uh, one of the questions we were uh, asking uh, in terms of policies, legislation, is what's happening really in school? What's happening? Is there any regulation about the use of digital devices in school? Is there anything that uh, um, 
allowed to regulate uh, how children or adolescents or teenagers or even young, uh, older students use their phones and devices. And uh, we have found so different situations across uh, the countries. And we have realized that, in fact, one of the messages I already shown is that uh, using technology should not be there for the use of technology, for the sake of technology. Education technology should be there when it allows to improve learning, when it has no impact on the well-being, on the safety and the privacy of students. So we all know the power of having a phone next to us. I have mine <laughs> next to me. And how much can be distracting, even a notification. So there have been studies that have shown that uh, it takes 20 minutes to students to refocus after they get a notification on a message uh, on their phone. And uh, it, there has been a study in uh, 14 countries showing that uh, really the phone is distracting. So um, it's uh, not, but the, the, the main issue is that uh, here is not to say that phone should not be used. Uh, phone uh, or devices are to be used only when they have pedagogical purposes, when they can or are used to improving learning outcomes. What does it mean, this? This means that uh, we need clear evidence about uh, the impact of phones or devices in schools. And what the studies help to know in this area until now is that uh, often screen time has uh, very uh, negative effects on melta, mental health, uh, depression system, see, even outside school. So there have been an explosion in the number of studies looking at the effect of screen times or using devices. And they extend from mental health to obesity to uh, other uh, depressive symptoms uh, to uh, sleep difficulties, uh, to, uh, as I was saying, distracting, so um, very negative effect on learning outcome, ex especially for the most disadvantaged learners. So that's something. What we need in this respect is also clear policies on what is permitted and is not permitted in school. We cannot say to a student, you should not use your phone when there is no regulation about that, when everyone can do what he or she wants in the classroom. Um, but it is also true that smartphone and devices can help, especially in the global south. This has, been, has become one of the methods people um, can learn. So, um, and I conclude with that. Uh, it is not just about banning the phone, it is thinking why the phone, the smartphone, the digital device are used. Uh, and uh, working with digital technology requires more than banning. It requires policies to prepare students and teachers uh, to use their phones or their digital devices with critical thinking. Uh, and uh, so this is why uh, when I was talking about the curricula and the need to reform curricula in a way that is, is broad and is not attached to a specific technology. So banning uh, is, is, is not just about banning the phone, it's talking about what is the use of this specific device, what is the utility and usefulness of these specific devices in school. Thank you so much. And um, Victor, if I could ask you, and the, um, the question was originally, um, I'm wondering what your response was to this recommendation and the thoughts that um, Anna has just said, but I see you nodding, so I think I might get a sense of what your response is. Um, can you have digital schools when mobile phones are, well, they're not actually banned, but they are placed in lockers at certain points of time? And as a separate question, how do digital schools evaluate the benefits and challenges of mental health issues in those schools? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me on behalf of the Digital Schools Award Programme. 
I'm from Belfast. I'm going to speak a little slower uh, because I think I've got about maybe 75% of what's being said uh, with the, the Scottish accent and so on. Um, <clears throat> banning mobile phones or, or digital devices uh, belong to people. So there are very good models of uh, bring your own device, both in Scotland and where I come from, Northern Ireland and, and in the Republic of Ireland. But where they are used well, they are, as Anna has said, uh, been subject to very rigorous policy implementation. Now, part of that policy has been, in one school in Scotland, incidentally, that the pupils sign up to having the school's internet safety and monitoring software in, uh, uploaded onto the phone. And if you don't agree to having it uploaded, don't bring your phone in. And that's, that's the way it works. So th there are some very good examples of that, and they are managed very well. But the other issue is in re relation to the whole idea of um, school-based uh, work uh, comes... Oh, sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> Thinking, who on earth is distracting us here? <laughs> it's me. I thought I had it on sound. Anyway, throw it out. <clears throat> uh, but this is an important point. The, the important, important point. point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the bring your own devices generally come without their own safeguarding software. Whereas when a school is operating a one-to-one -one policy or a procurement policy, those devices will all come with rigorous, tried and tested internet safety structures and software and implementation and networking protections and so on. So that's the, I think that's an important distinction point that we need to make in terms of bring your own device. I want to talk about digital well-being. Um, <clears throat> There is no more important message that we can send to schools and indeed to the community and to the workforce who will be receiving our digital citizens as, as uh, hopefully digitally competent workers. Um, there is no, no more important message than we are teaching our children not only to be safe online but how to identify, withstand um, <clears throat> learn from and, and uh, recover from uh, internet incidents. Now, those of you who are working in Scotland will recognise those as the Scottish Internet Safety Policy Framework. <clears throat> I think that framework is a very useful uh, structure for schools, and I want to focus particularly on the last two elements of that, recovering from and learning from. Uh, internet incidents. I think schools need to have open conversation, particularly uh, post-primary schools and in particularly in the senior end of schools. There needs to be an open conversation about um, digital well-being. Now, in a school, for example, in rural Ireland, um, their digital leader team has a very open conversation with the uh, digital coordinators, the teacher coordinators. Those pupils have that open conversation where they alert the teachers to any emerging software issues, any emerging trends among the pupils where there is a risk to digital well-being and indeed pupil safety. And I think that open dialogue and student voice is very important. Thank you so much, uh, Victor. Ollie, can I move on to you? How might the Scottish Government reconcile situations where the recommendations coming from the GEM report receive local pushback? Now, parents groups in particular here in Scotland are keen to understand the role of iPads in primary school, especially in relation to Scotland's Empowered Learning Programme. Okay, th uh, thanks. Um, so, so a cu couple of things, really, really, I suppose. So, so Anna, I thought, that, I thought that your response was really, really helpful around that. And the reason that I thought that was really, really helpful was that when the GEMS report came out, the, 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 the media capitalised on that, li that the line that mobile phones should be banned in schools around that, and that's not what the GEMS report you know, is saying you know, at all. And I think that importantly, your point about the global south is incredibly important, you know, because when we think about the, the evidence that comes from the GEMS report um, around 
why mobile phones should not necessarily be used in, in schools. It, you know, it draws off a, a meta-analysis, albeit kind of four, like four, four, 40, 14 studies, but, but actually not very many of those studies, um, you know, well, none of them come from Scotland. There's one that comes from the UK, but it's four school districts in England, you know, around, around that for, first of all. Yet, if you go through the GEMS report and you look at the benefits of mobile phones and mobile technology in the global south, the report was littered through that in terms of how it could actually improve sort of learning outcomes. So I think that's a really, really important point to, to start with. So we need to be careful not to sensationalise like some of this. Um, what, what I would say about the use of iPads in school, in particularly primary schools at, at, at the moment, is that they've been in primary schools for a really, really long time, o o almost since iPads first came out around, around that. In fact, Apple, you know, at the time had a big push on iPads in schools because they thought it would be an appropriate learning device around that. And it's part, partly to do with commercialisation, but there's also an interesting price point around that compared to the laptops to sort of try and make that work. Where I think we've currently got pushback some of the time is, of course, actually that, that actually now the Empowered Learning Programme and similar programmes in, in borders, um, in the Scottish borders and in, and in Glasgow that use iPads and Falkirk that use iPads, um, in Stirling that use Chromebooks and Highland that use Chromebooks around that, is that all young children now have got a device normally from primary six to S6 around that and in some local authorities from... Um, primary four, you know, to S6 around that. So, so, it's not, so it's not as if these technologies hadn't been being used in primary schools or in secondary schools before, but there are just more of them now, and people are questioning the purpose of that, and then also the cost investment of that as well, which I think the GEMS report highlights, you know, sort of quite, quite importantly. So what I would say about this, which I think is really, really important, is that the schools have got a responsibility here, you know, to make sure that parents understand what the young people are using, you know, the technology for, and is it being used in an, appro in an, appropriate, in an appropriate way. Um, and I don't always think that, um, that schools are good at doing this. Schools are good at doing the learning and teaching part, but they're not always good at communicating the benefits of good learning and teaching with parental bodies and, and, and doing that. Some of them are really, really good at that. Um, but again, I think this is something that we need to, to work on a, a little bit more. Um, the only other, the couple of other things that I just sort of would want to sort of mention around this, and I think that both Anna and Victor you know, have, have summarised this sort of quite well, is it's, it's about what the, what the children and young people are using the technologies for, and is it enhancing learning? And you saw from the diagram that I put up earlier is that learning, digital learning and teaching strategies about how do we use digital technology to enhance learning to sort of try and make that work. Um, and Mitch Resnick, the professor at the MIT you know, Media Lab, has got a, a wonderful phrase you know, around, around, around this. And he says that maybe we should be stop talking about reducing screen time and start talking about increasing creativity time in that. And I think there's an interesting point, you know, around some of these things, because it's actually what are young people doing with the technology? You know, are they using it to create? Are they using it to deepen their learning? You know, are they using it to be passive consumers of content as well? So these are important messages that we need to sort of package up to make them accessible to, to parents, uh, the, the young people themselves, and also new teachers coming into the school. Thank you so much, um, Ollie. And Simon, with your background in research in um, Global South countries particularly, we could say that mobile phones arguably play a more important part of life in many Global South countries where they vastly outnumber um, computers. Can you help us understand what this recommendation might mean in these countries? Okay, thanks Gary, and thanks to Manas and Anna and the team for what I think is a really excellent report. So I think we need to break down that statement a little bit more. So, yes, phone coverage high, but what type of phones is the first question. So a lot of people who have access to phones don't have the most, don't have smartphones or have, you know, old, old phones. And data cost. The data cost, you know, think you, think you have Scotland's traditional link to Malawi, the cost in Malawi is several times what it is here for data. And so a lot of people, even if they have a phone, are having to be extremely selective in how they use them. So we have to put that into the mix, knowing that varies across countries. Some countries in the South, you know, there's much more um, have been done about um, data access. But, you know, data, I think, actually is the, is the, is the major thing there. But then if we're, if we're kind of going on to, you know, some, some what you know, Anna was presenting about policy. Um, you know, I know um, my colleagues in the Right to Education Initiative were, were kind of important interlocutors of, of the team here. And I think when we're thinking about this, a lot of the questions about who's getting access, and Anna was very, very keen to stress about the equitable dimensions of that. 
Um, for, from the Right to Education initiative, we'd be drawing on um, Katrina Tomchevsky's work about the, the four A's of accessibility. And as Anna says, policy is one thing. You know, there are policies everywhere in the world. What those policies mean in practice is a very different thing. So we need to be thinking much more about availability. What is the, so what I was just saying, but you know, when we're looking at equipment in schools, what actually is there for people? And I think particularly, and again, the report is strong on this, thinking about those who are most marginalized. And Anna mentioned students living with disabilities and she mentioned refugees. And thinking what is it that makes those groups more able to access technologies, including phones, and how do we focus primarily there rather than on, on systemic coverage. Those who know me will, will know that at GM, GMR meetings, I like to say, yes, schools are important, but they're not the only thing. Um, and I just want to give one very small example about the centrality of mobile phones in life and the importance of adult literacy and numeracy in this. So one small example uh, from a project um, that we've been working on with colleagues in Somaliland. Um, mobile payment is now everywhere in many countries in the world. But then you require the literacy, the numeracy, to be able to know how many zeros. And so what might seem an arcane thing of, of place value to maths teachers here is actually about survival and economic success for people, knowing that when someone's paid them, there's a right number of zeros in, the, in, in what's on the phone there. So we've been working with informal traders in Hargeisa to build up their ability to not be swindled. You know, so, so we need to think about what are those spaces in, and I was stressed, particularly adult education, again from that inclusion perspective, the most marginalised. That's enough for me, thanks. Thank you. Now, if we could move on to artificial intelligence. Um, ben, you have written a lot on artificial intelligence. Can you share more about how you see AI fitting into education? And what, if any, concerns you have? Um, we've heard just now the most marginalised and the poorest communities um, are often those first subjected to experiments in education. Do you think this will be the same with AI? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, try to put in some concerns about AI and education to a couple of minutes. Um, so there's maybe a couple of just key points to make. The first is that I think AI, artificial intelligence, can be uh, an extremely misleading uh, and slippery uh, term to use, and we need to be much more precise uh, about what's meant by AI, because there is an awful lot of uh, hype and anxiety as well about it at the moment. I see it partly as a marketing term. It makes technology seem an awful lot more capable than they actually are. So I think as educators, as people working in the education sector, I think we do need to be extremely cautious about claims of you know, highly capable artificial uh, intelligence. But these kinds of claims do, of course, generate um, uh, an awful lot of interest. I think we then need to be clear about what precisely then are the forms of artificial intelligence that are either being promoted or used in education. And I think there are probably two distinct forms. One is a kind of data-driven student monitoring version of artificial intelligence. You know, this is uh, things like student data analytics or learning analytics. Um, it includes uh, student plagiarism detection, um, proctoring software and a, and a range of other things, including student social media monitoring in, in the US in, in particular. So we've got the kind of data-driven student monitoring or surveillance AI. And then we've got what we've heard an awful lot about, of course, over the last 12 months, which is generative AI um, that can produce content with a text or images in, in relation to a prompt. And of course, there's a huge amount of uh, excitement uh, about that at, at the moment. Uh, both of them could potentially create uh, or reproduce inequalities, the student monitoring version, maybe historical data sets that mean uh, students in the present are uh, particular assumptions are made about them on the basis of past data sets and so on, or generative AI might um, reproduce particular biases and stereotypes. So those, I think, are, are really pressing uh, concerns. Mm -hmm. For me, I think, though, the more important issue to get at beyond the, the technology itself is to think quite carefully about the kinds of contexts in which AI is being 
the, the context is being put in or that it's being imagined to be put in. And I, I say that just for a couple of, because of a couple of examples over the last year, well, the last couple of months, about how um, things like chat GPT have already begun being used in education. And one is that schools in Republican-run districts in some parts of the United States have begun using chat GPT to identify books that should be banned from school libraries because there are particular Republican-introduced laws on sexual content in books. And this has resulted in books like 1984 and A Handmaid's Tale being banned from school libraries. So this is about the kind of the, the, the deployment of generative AI as a kind of weapon mm. in culture wars. Um, then the other example, this is just from last week, is the Department for Education in England announced it's investing two million pounds in an AI-driven lesson planning resource for school teachers via the Oak National Academy, which is a kind of centralized cur online curriculum uh, resource. Now they argue this is gonna reduce teacher workload. For me, that seems like a, a pure technical solution to a much, much more complex problem about teacher workload, teacher retention, teacher training in a really highly politicized uh, context in, in England at the moment. And it also brings about more kind of uh, automated control of the way in which teachers go about uh, their job. So I think there's all sorts of concerns uh, around AI that, that as an education sector we need to face up to and confront uh, more clearly. That's really, really interesting. Um, wow, there's a lot there. As you say, two minutes is too short a time, but that's all we've got. I've got a whole book out at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are pieces in there. Um, Simon, you're the Director of Research at the University of Glasgow. Can you help us understand if the role of AI in education differs by education level? And what role do you see it playing in research at university level? I think, you know, on, on, on the first part of that, it's, yes, of course, it does vary, but the kind of things that Ben talk, tends, Ben's talking about, you know, obviously those things vary according to level, you know, so if it's about learning to use the generative AI, then obviously how that translates into, into teaching and learning at different levels will vary. The sophistication in which we're learning to evaluate it, so what Victor was saying about you know, how we're ensuring well-being, the, 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 the safe use of technology, obviously the levels of that will vary as, according to, to which level. The proctoring and all those things clearly do vary, and you know, that's for people who are much more versed in, in kind of curriculum and pedagogy than me to talk about what is appropriate at different levels, but clearly we do need to have, uh, you know, important questions about that. I'd like to slide off slightly, though, into, um, you know, from the research perspective of seeing this partly as part, you know, part of wider debates about technology. We heard Elon Musk being as sensible as always in the last few days, talking about how AI will end work. Work has been ended by so many technologies over the years. This will just be another one that ends it not very much. <laughs> but clearly it will do things. But of course, when we're thinking about the relationship between education and technology in the research space, we have to think that technological choices are choices. They're not inevitabilities. Mm -hmm. And some of those choices come down to, um, you know, for instance, the very different way that Scotland and England, with our reference over to Oak, have, have decided to use technology and how far that was a political decision, how far it was um, to do with, you know, with corruption and, and frankly, in the English system and the, the way of giving money to mates. Um, so I think there are real questions about how we are using technology. Of course, from, from my interest in, in you know, vocational learning and you know, one of the things I was doing for UNESCO recently for the Bureau of Education was looking about the future of skills in Africa and what that meant for the education system. Clearly, these things will, will have a difference, but we've got to look at how exactly the jobs change. It's the same as looking at sustainability, a whole range of things. Jobs will change. But we need to understand at a very detailed sector by sector, country by country, occupation by occupation level, what actually is changing and therefore what we need to do about it. Thanks, Simon. Um, Anna, the 
you raised this actually a bit in your presentation, but the AI development is changing so quickly. How does the GEM report engage with topics that develop during the research and reporting cycle, and what future do you see for AI in education? Because as you were saying, things are moving so fast, and you know, the last three years, things have moved even faster in this field. Thank you, Gary. Do, uh, do I have uh, one hour to answer this question? <laughs> no, I mean, I think there are two parts in this question. The first part, how we engage with topics like uh, AI or topics that uh, appear uh, on the scene uh, in such a way and because of chatbot, I would say, this year. Uh, uh, ChatGPT in November, nobody was talking um, yet about uh, ChatGPT and suddenly everyone was talking about uh, ChatGPT and other GPT and we were already very advanced in the making of the report. Of course artificial intelligence was part of the report. Um, if you look at the monitoring part of the report, artificial intelligence is dealt with in the um, in the part of uh, the evolution of skills demand and uh, I think we are very aligned with what Simon just said in this case because uh, the report says that just thinking always about workers obsolescence maybe we should focus a little bit more on training needs to make uh, uh, these uh, um, I mean, uh, the adaptation of the workers' reality. So, um, so we were working on that, but artificial intelligence, as, been, as Ben said, is really a huge concept. UNESCO is working a lot on that. As you know, there were the ethics recommendations that were published in 2021 and approved by all countries that committed to this ethics recommendation in artificial intelligence in different dimensions, including educational research and uh, the education sector of UNESCO has published in September 2023 the guidance uh, for generative artificial intelligence. So, I mean, what we did with uh, the GEM report was looking really at uh, what we could communicate in terms of uh, uh, some important points. And I think, again, as, I, as you said, I presented a little bit about it. One issue is reinforcing curricula. Reinforcing curricula, not just looking at uh, technology skills, but also arts humanities that maybe will be even more needed in the future to deal with this artificial intelligence system that uh, require uh, empathy and a lot of other um, um, attitudes and behavior that may be uh, delivered with broader curriculum that uh, uh, have been uh, created for that uh, or reformed for that. The second point is really what we have as evidence that artificial intelligence really change the, the way students learn or teacher teach. And so we need much more evidence about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence. Then there is the point of we cannot protect we cannot shield the students from any in, in, innovative technology. And uh, artificial intelligence as a big umbrella may also present some benefits. So we need to prepare students uh, with uh, the, the skills uh, in terms of also, as I said before, critical skills, but also the, the capacity of being protected uh, uh, from the risk emerging from artificial intelligence in terms of safety, privacy, responsibility and ethics. Finally, I think that the point of uh, machine learning and bias of artificial intelligence is something that is very important. So this system, the machine learning, algorithm are profoundly biased and so these things need to be said we need evidence on the bias and how to counteract the bias that are implicit in the way the, the, the artificial intelligence system are built. So just a very, there are some translation um, or some AI algorithm when you Think about that, when you use that, you have everything that is gender biased. 
So uh, facial recognition systems are biased. The, the people that have uh, um, the minority may be really at risk. So we need to think about all these risks emerging from the uh, use of this uh, AI algorithm and the uh, AI system and I think that uh, really the, the guidance from UNESCO that has been published uh, point to some of this uh, and I, I suggest that uh, it's a good guide uh, to mm. start with. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I, I, I would just say hearing from um, you all on AI and the, the importance of having of recognizing difference. Yes. Different parts of the world respond in different ways to AI and to its inclusion in education. And frequently, as we asked you, Anna, the speed at which things are moving means that often the global north will get the newest version yes. and the global south will have the oldest mm -hmm. version. And the oldest version may not well be particularly relevant. So, Simon, there's some further work for you to build on. Um, can I move on to the role of government? To um, Ollie, if I may. The report notes shortcomings in the role of government as a decision maker and a funder of education, sorry, of technology. What role does the Scottish government play in supporting and regulating technology in education in Scotland? And how should government respond to the requirements of parents and teachers? And these were specific questions that came up quite a lot from our audience. Great, no, thanks. And it's a, it's a good question. It's also hugely complex in, in many ways as well. And of course, one of the reasons it's, it's hugely complex is because um, much of the decision making um, you know, in, in, in Scotland is around, around, around spend. And certainly the statutory responsibility for the improvement to education is, of course, done locally. Uh, around that, it's probably worth pointing out that there have been, you know, significant investments, you know, in education, education technology over a long period of time, you know, in, in, in Scotland. So, for example, Scotland was one of the first countries in the world to commit to um, one computer per classroom. Yeah. Around that, it was one of the first countries in the world to have online communities, quite sophisticated online communities for head teachers and deputy head teachers, and then community workers as part of that. Uh, it's had projects uh, around emerging technologies for learning, um, including the use of computer games in the classroom, the use of the web when that, when that, when that first came out. So there have been big investments over time. And of course, um, one of the projects which uh, you know, Scotland is sort of quite famous for, and we could have a discussion around the, the success of it or not, is that it was the first country in the world to have its own education internet you know, as, a, as a result of that, which meant that it was the first country in the world for all teachers to have an email address and to be able to communicate with it. Now, of course, some of the challenges with these big national projects is it still needs to be taken up locally, like in order, in order, for, that to, in order for that to work. Um, and that's, I suppose, an increasing challenge when we go back to that first question I was asked around kind of iPads around that. Uh, and of course, and the reason for that is because you know, there are a number of local authorities now that have gone down one-to-one -one technology routes, um, but those are decisions that have been made locally, you know, using local democracy, and that's a decision that those local authorities have, in, have, have, have chosen to invest in you know, around that. So it's hugely complex you know, in, this, in, this, you know, in, in, in this area. So in terms of investment, as I said, there's a lot of investment in that. There continues to be um, investment, particularly around the work around the Scottish Futures Trust, and particularly around sort of new school estate, which has got very, very specific standards in terms of infrastructure, you know, and school build and the integration of technology, including sustainability uh, within that. But that doesn't always help the old school buildings that are there around that. There's also been significant investment uh, over the years in, um, you know, in, in, in internet connectivity to, to local authorities and into Scottish schools via the Pathfinder North and the Pathfinder South project. That's why in Scotland we found ourselves in a very interesting situation a number of years ago where uh, quite often the connectivity was better in our rural schools than it was in our city schools as a, as a, as a result of that. So there are, there are challenges with all of this. I'm just sort of trying to paint the picture that actually it's, in, it's in, incredibly complex. In terms of other investment, I think it's worth to sort of say that there's been a lot of investment around kind of curriculum, curriculum development around that. So in terms of our current experiences and outcomes, the education that children get between the ages of, of 3 to 15, the technologies outcomes are the only ones that have been refreshed you know, in the last sort of 10 to 15 years. We're hoping the curriculum reform will do that, but there's been an investment in that area there. And, and I've mentioned earlier, and I'm sure that we'll get on to discuss this, the investment in professional development, in particular, how do you lead digital learning and teaching? You know, there's an important focus for us um, move, moving forward. 
Um, big investment in terms of initiatives um, and, and, and programs. I've already mentioned Glow and the, you know, and, the, and, the, and the use of Glow, but also more recently in terms of the investment in professional learning around things like the big microbit rollouts, um, both from the BBC, but the refreshed microbit rollout, which has been sponsored by the Nominet Trust just recently, you know, and that's gone out to all Scottish primary schools as well. And out of all of the home nations, you know, I'm delighted to say that 90% of all Scottish primary schools signed up to that as a result of um, interventions from our teams at Education Scotland to, 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 do, to do that. So um, there's a lot of investment that, go, that, go, that goes on. I'm seeing that my sort of time is, is up around that, but, but that, let's, let's pick up on this after, uh, afterwards over, over coffee. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Victor, can you speak more about the relationship with and guidance from the government and your schools, and just particularly regarding the regulatory environment? Yeah, um, I, I was fascinated by one of the slides, well, fascinated by all of your slides, Holly, <laughs> but one in particular was the timeline of policy implementation. And again and again and again, almost year on year, there's some new policy review. Now, one of those uh, um, policies that, uh, that Ollie put up was from Professor Ken Muir, putting learners at the centre. And one of the things in his report, again and again, comes through is that teachers are experiencing policy overload. So we've got to be careful in how we begin to say, okay, well, how does the policy be implemented in schools? Mary Burns, in her preparatory paper for the GEM report, cites three barriers, and I was fascinated by these three barriers, first order, second order, and third order barriers, she calls them. Um, one was infrastructure, first order. Yes. The second two are personal characteristics of teachers and pedagogy. Yes. So it seems to me that there's a picture emerging that the policy is there, the infrastructure is there, all the necessary bits and pieces to equip teachers are there, but somehow there's something happening at the classroom door. Now the question is, what is that? Now, coming from Northern Ireland uh, and having looked at your document, Higgius 4, I think it's an excellent framework for uh, bridging the gap between policy and teacher practice. It has lots of really good uh, tips and, and, uh, and, and aids for teachers, quality indicators and so on. So I'm wondering in terms of getting policy back into the classroom, I don't know, uh, is it time for a Higgius 4.1 or a Higgius 5? I dare say, where the quality indicators for digital learning and teaching, and I use that phrase deliberately, not digital technology, digital learning and teaching, the quality indicators are clear for teachers, the examples are there, and the, the ways to bring it in to promote good quality teaching and learning, which I think hopefully will come through in the next question. Um, I think something like that to help teachers bridge that gap between policy and practice is going to be important. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, um, beyond working with schools, what role does the national government and the other agencies have in regulating or monitoring EdTech actors? Yeah, thanks. Um, that was a really strange question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard to know exactly what to advise governments to do. It'd be interesting to have a conversation with, with people like Ollie uh, about this a bit more. But, but I think it's clear that what we've seen over the last few years are the emergence and the number of examples of different ways of monitoring or regulating educational technologies that, you know, we should probably get these people in a room together and come up, you know, and, and find ways to properly enact them. I think some of the most impressive ones I've seen, or the most interesting ones, are the work by the Digital Futures Commission um, in the last year, that in its large report um, on digital learning suggested the need for a kind of independent kite mark scheme. So this was very much focused on um, finding way in some sort of independent mechanism to ensure that uh, educational technology vendors can prove that, that they've got evidence that their tech does what they claim it does before any school can engage in some sort of procurement uh, activity. So I think that, that seems to me absolutely essential. That we, we need to find some way of having independent evidence mechanism put into the procurement uh, chain for, for schools and perhaps for, for universities, although we tend to have bigger procurement 
um, people in, in our institutions. Um, that, were, that particular scheme was also specifically focused on uh, protecting uh, students, children's uh, data protection and privacy rights as well. So that was an absolutely core part of that. So I think that's where it sort of you know, begins to factor in some of the, the risks of AI as well. Then there are some other really interesting uh, developments, like the Federal Trade Commission in states, you know, this is a huge governmental department, uh, wouldn't normally intervene in education. But it's intervened in ed education technology because it said that children's learning must not be conditional on surveillance. So it's found that the industry of education technology platforms is systematically gathering far more data than they legally require to function because they're gathering that data as the basis for a sort of the speculative basis for value making in the future. What products can you make out of the data? So that seems to me, you know, that's an important, you know, high level governmental thing. I think more broadly though, for, for, for other agencies, I think reports like the GEM report, the EdTech tragedy report that also came out recently from UNESCO, is kind of, you know, developing a sense that there is a, a sector wide pushback or increasing vigilance about some of these education technologies and platforms. Yes, there are lots and lots of potential benefits, but we're also in a in, in, um, uh, pretty tricky uh, territory at the moment. And many of the organizations that are promising that there is a, a transformative digital future of education just ahead are ed tech industry companies. They are big tech multinationals like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and so on. Um, and they are investors because it is education technology or technology investors that are actually pumping money into products to make them exist. Mm -hmm. And they're only putting money into things that can gather lots and lots of data or that have AI functionality. So that's why we have these kind of data hungry uh, AI type platforms. So I think we need much more vigilance about the kinds of organizations that are actually seeking to uh, restructure uh, our sector for us. That's so interesting, thank you. And as you said, we can't We've all said, can't deal in two minutes with these huge areas, but I'm, I'm sure you're happy to take further questions afterwards and maybe through email, all of you. Thank you. Let's move on to the final area, which is about teachers. Victor, if I can come to you, um, what does a teacher in a digital school look like? Um, how, how do teachers interact with AI and students in classes? And would virtual schools and remote specialist teachers be feasible for Scotland's island communities? Okay, uh, well, what does a teacher in a digital school look like? Well, at my age, they're all very young, I can tell you that. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, um, th there, there are several things, I think, um, sort of impact on what a, what a digital teacher, if I can use that phrase, looks like. Um, there, there's a book published recently um, which uh, Aubrey Smith and Twinning and they talk a lot about teachers self-perception and they make this statement, I want to read it out, teachers perceptions often structure what and how they implement digital technologies for teaching and learning. Now what that says to me is that a teacher's traditional pedagogical principles are probably reproduced and they talk about, um, I think it's Mary Burns talks about substitutive rather than uh, redefinitional use of technology and I'd like to illustrate that if I may with two examples from classes that I visited recently, both in very good schools, exceptionally well connected, one-to-one -one devices, exceptionally well uh, equipped, uh, neither of them in Scotland by the way. Um, <clears throat> School number one, uh, all the children were sitting at a laptop Chromebook or something, I can't remember, with their headphones on, and they were responding to the dialogue and filling in a, an online sheet. Now, uh, I'm an old fashioned person, I really believe in Bloom, and I believe in those higher order thinking skills and where we can bring them into any teaching we have to. It seems to me that it was a bit of drill and practice, except it was digital technology drill and practice and so on. Second school, uh, again in another part of rural Ireland, um, the teacher had asked the students to research a topic they had come in 
and they were split into groups and they began to discuss the outcomes of their individual research in their groups. The teacher threw up a padlet on board uh, on the on the whiteboard and the students then had to fill in in their groups maybe four or five groups in the class each group had a padlet section and they began to put their outcomes of their discussion five minutes later ten minutes later the uh, discussion was stopped and the teacher began to guide the students in synthesizing and bringing together the good points of the issue and it happened to be um, uh, sports science uh, the good points of the issue and, and so on and they there was a lot of synergy of those so they were tasked then to take those away and to bring out their own uh, report maybe apply it to their own practice or whatever but the teacher turned that into a flipped classroom now there was one teacher who had uh, the class swimming and technology but was still on a very low pedagogical foothold if you like the other teacher had used the technology to transform how she understood her pedagogy, and I think that's the important thing. So I think a digital, what a digital school will look like will be a teacher will take the digital technologies that are available to him and her, and they will say, how can I transform? What can I do with this that I can't do with pen and paper or ordinary classroom? Um, as to AI and, uh, and, and, and the islands, maybe I'm, I'm not sure if I have time, but I'm glad uh, Ben talked about AI being a slippery term. I suspect I'm not the only person in this room who, when I, AI is mentioned, is scratching his head and thinking, I wonder what that really is. We have all the hype and so on, but what it is and what it looks like in school, I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm not sure a lot of teachers out there are yet coming to terms with it. Well, that, that feeds very well, thank you, Victor. Field feeds very well into the last question to Ollie. Um, Ollie, how is the Scottish Government supporting schools and teachers, especially in light of current difficulties in maintaining upskilling of IT knowledge and capabilities in teachers? And how relevant and influential are international organisations in these processes? So again, another, another, another good question. So, so I suppose again, um, some of the professional link up skilling is done is done locally around that. However, we have got a national offer uh, as well for people that aren't a, who would prefer to either access the national offer or or where there's not an offer locally around that because we appreciate that different schools are in different sizes, local authorities are different sizes, but also actually it's really, really good to get different teachers all over Scotland collaborating together because that's how you can solve problems in, 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 some, in some ways. So um, our national offer includes um, a whole variety of online professional training courses. I think it's important for this audience to know that if you look back at what we were offering five years ago, which was really about using the technology, it's more now around the pedagogy of the technology behind it. We still do, uh, we still do run some online training courses and face-to-face -face courses in actually how to use the technology, but a lot of it now is around the pedagogy behind the technology, trying to link that into learning science and to make, and to make that work, and increasing amount also around um, subject-specific pedagogies with, the, with and without digital technology to sort of try and make that work, uh, and a huge investment in the leadership you know, of digital technologies, particularly at school leaders. I've mentioned already, you know, we've got our profiles that exist, you know, we could call those personas as well, about what does a digital literate pupil look like, a teacher look like, a school, um, uh, a school leader look like, a, a digital school look like, um, to be able to fit that in. Uh, and I suppose the other bit that we're really committed to in terms of what we do is that um, we're really committed to thinking about the purpose of Scottish education and how digital technology can support that. And I think this is a good point maybe to end on, is that when we think about the purpose of Scottish education, we think about those four capacities, as in what does it mean for a young person to be confident, successful, responsible, and effective in that. Now, quite often, when we hear about digital technologies in school, we hear about underconfidence, people receding, like, rather than being confident in that. We hear about being successful, but at the expense of other things. So we can put down our phone, but therefore we can actually improve in certain quite narrow measures around that. Um, we hear about irresponsible technology rather than responsible technology um, and then about how, do we, how, how are we effective using the technology as well. So we're quite committed in all of our programmes to be focusing these around the four capacities which are the purposes of Scottish education and coming back to that. 
and not just focusing on uh, the successful learning part, which quite often comes down to sort of narrow measures and exam results as a part of it. And I think that's an important uh, process going forward. And, and finally, the only thing that I would say in terms of international reports, international benchmarks, is that we do take in, into account of those. We do do work with UNESCO, the OECD, other um, non-government international, uh, non -government international organisations. But I'll come back to the point that I made at the end of my presentation, is that um, I think there should be more of a two-way process. I think there's lots of things that we're doing in Scotland that we do quite well, although we can continue to improve. How do we continue to, to work more in partnership with international organisations, I think? Well, I think you have a chat with the person to your right. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. That was really helpful. I, I want to thank our panelists, um, and as we are, are getting close to the end here, I'm going to uh, invite our closing speaker up, and our panelists can go ahead and have, it, have a seat. Thank you so much for sharing your insights across those four topics. So our final person today to give our closing remarks is Professor Sean Bain. So Sean Bain is Professor of Digital Education and Co-Director of Education at the Education or Edinburgh Futures Institute. She directs the Center for Research and Digital Education. Her research is critical and interdisciplinary, currently focuses on higher education futures, utopia, and theories, and theories of enhancement. She is one of the authors of the Manifesto for Teaching Online, gives regular keynotes on the futures of digital education, publishes widely, and has conducted research funded by UKRI, Erasmus Plus, Advanced Higher Education, and Nesta. So welcome, Sean. Thank you. Thanks very much, Will, for inviting me to um, do the closing remarks. I love doing closing remarks because it means I have to switch off my email during the event. And I think if we're talking about banning smartphones in classrooms, maybe we should also be talking about banning email in events. Um, but thank you so much to all the speakers today. It's been a fabulous um, morning, very wide-ranging discussion, but I think it's um, testament to the richness of the report and that um, you and colleagues have produced that everything has sort of looped consistently and coherently back to the findings um, and recommendations and vision that's um, within that report. So I, I suppose just to kind of zoom out again a bit, I've obviously been taking lots of detailed notes as people have been speaking, but for me, UNESCO reports have always set a high bar for visionary, future-facing, inclusive, broad um, conversations and visions for the future of um, education. And I think this report is is very much within that um, kind of that, that culture and history. If you think back as far as the 1972 FOIA report, um, I'm sure colleagues have all read this one. It's the kind of critical point of, um, I don't know, uh, a light <laughs> in a way in the history of the kind of uh, education futures. We saw a strong awareness even back then in 1972 of the potential of digital education. Um, the FOIA report called that called it cybernetic pedagogy. Um, and I was thinking, if only we'd kept the terminology of cybernetic pedagogy rather than artificial intelligence, I think it would, it has, it contains within itself a very different imaginary and would perhaps avoid, enable us to avoid some of these kind of, um, these conversations we're having currently about AI um, and its expectation that it will match human intelligence. Um, so I think also for a foreign team looking back to that report, um, got it. Um, Digital education was seen as a way, and this is a quote, of supporting methods of organizing education based on the principles of dialogue between man and machine. Sorry, the gendered language is obviously of its time. Um, but from our current viewpoint, and I think as we've heard this morning, we can see how these new methods of organizing education have tended to function under a, a driving logic of profit performance and technological solutionism. And that's part of our, um, what we have to address as researchers and practitioners and critical thinkers in this space. Um, I think the, the, the four report made another really important point about digital education, which is that strong support must be given to democracy is the only way, again, for man to become if, to avoid becoming enslaved to machines. And that kind of perspective has taken on a new kind of, um, a new energy, I suppose, around the current conversations around, um, around artificial intelligence. There's a sense that it's the power of meaningfully participative democracy, which is going to underpin a lot of um, how we're able to respond. So I think 
the, I'm, gonna, I'm nearly finished, so don't worry. Um, so the current, I think the current report is bang on target in regards to all these issues with its really strong messages. And I think some of the critical ones that have been emphasized today, um, are, this is my top seven, there were so many more I could have said, that, but it's in the interests of pupils and students, it's the interests of pupils and students that should take precedence over commercial considerations. I think that's such an important point that you did bang home, Anna, really beautifully in your introduction. Um, it's the civic value learning outcomes and children's interests, not technology that should be driving educational change. Um, the right to education is increasingly synonymous with the right to meaningful connectivity. And again, that has come through really strongly in all the conversations today alongside this idea that much of the evidence of the impact and value of technology comes from those trying to sell it. That has another, been another really strong theme. Um, what we've also talked about, and the panel was really great on this one, is that the knowledge projects of the Western North do tend to dominate online content and on the, our imaginaries we have of the online, um, and that we're not doing well enough at ensuring children's data privacy. Um, I think one point that didn't come through as strongly as it might have today was that we aren't maybe looking hard enough at the climate and planetary impact of digital device manufacture, energy use, emissions levels of data capture, storage and transfer. And I think that's, that's something I know is in that report to an extent, but that we need to be having more conversations about. So. Just to finish, I think as this report has demonstrated, the UNESCO continues to be this vital beacon of hopeful, critical thinking about education futures. And thank you, thank you for that. And thank you also to the um, to the supporters um, of this of, of this event today, to Will for organising it, um, and these amazing speakers we've had. And I think being here this morning has made me given me a new confidence that we can ensure that the agendas of this report continue to be well woven through the conversations we're having in Scotland and beyond. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Sean, and thank you for everybody for the conversation today and the discussion today. Um, it's been hopefully a very enriching discussion. I hope you all got, came, some, came out of this with something, um, looking at the next rec round of recommendations, how we can incorporate them in our own teaching or research or classroom or life. So as we end today, I want to thank again our presenters and panelists. I uh, especially want to thank our panel moderator, Dr. Gary Dunn. I also want to thank the two people that helped put this on with me. So uh, Shikhan Wad and Joanna Martinez, who were working, especially Shikhan, for months to help put this together. Uh, really appreciate all the work behind that. So uh, thanks so much, everybody, for joining. I hope we continue this conversation. but. We've got an event coming in here next, so please do continue the conversation in the corridor or enjoy the Scottish weather. It's actually beautiful today. Uh, enjoy the courtyard out there. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it's been a wonderful event. We hope you have a great day.